the meaning of praise is the offering of thanks through our lips. So when we talk about his greatness, we're making confession to his name. When we talk about what he's done for us, true praise and worship will bring you into a life of power. And a lot of things that you pray for and ask God for, you'd find you don't need to pray and ask for. You know, clapping is neither praise nor worship. But clapping is not bad. Clapping is applause. It is a sign of approval. It is neither praise nor worship. You've heard people say, let's clap for Jesus. Right? They're, they're, they're clapping. I haven't even, I didn't tell you to clap for Jesus. I said, you've heard people say, clap for Jesus or clap for the Lord and so on. But spiritually, it makes no sense. Because clapping is neither praise nor worship. I want you to get this. I want you to understand. I told you we will talk about the spirituality of ministry today. And we'll look at music. This is very important. In fact, it brings to my mind uh, an experience that um, Kenneth E. Hagen had years ago in the early 90s. Probably 1992 or, or 93, somewhere thereabout. And uh, he said that they were, they were preparing for their annual convention. And on one of those days as he was praying towards the meetings, he saw a vision. And, uh, you know, he was a, a remarkable minister of the gospel. And he particularly expounded the, the message of faith to the body of Christ around the world like no one else did. He was a prophet. And on that occasion, he said, in that vision, the Lord Jesus appeared to him. And uh, said this to him. That clapping is neither praise nor worship. He was absolutely right. And he talked to him in that vision about several other things. Which... Uh, many do in the congregations of God assuming them to be spiritual. And the Lord said to him you've gone as far as you can go. In other words the Lord didn't expect him to be able to correct it in the body of Christ. It took too long for him to discover such a thing. That truth came to him at his old age. And the Lord said, you've gone as far as you can go.
how much more would he do to be able to correct that? Well, this was in the early 90s, like I said. And for someone like me, it was easy to catch those truths still young. Easy to catch those truths and, and understand them in the light of God's word. Because some heard that message and thought that he meant that clapping was wrong. No, clapping was not wrong. He, he was saying, put it in its place. It's neither praise nor worship. Put it in its place. So a lot of them didn't get it. For example, um, when a miracle happens and people clap, they're not praising God with the clapping. They are responding to their excitement. And they are approving what they just saw. And then they then they neglect to actually praise or worship God. You see, we worship God with words. We worship God when we lift our hands. You see, lifting of the hands is in worship. It says, let the lifting up of my hands be as the evening sacrifice. But there was more clapping among God's people than lifting their hands. Most were never taught to lift their hands. In fact, a lot of people lift their hands, but they don't even know why. They've never studied it in the Word of God to know why they lift their hands. But Paul, writing to Timothy, said, I will that all men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without rot. What kind of pray, prayer was that? Prayer of worship. Lifting holy hands. But most were never taught. They lifted their hands because the congregation lifted hands. They lifted their hands because the, the man or woman who was conducting the service said, now lift your hands. They never knew from the word of God what it implied. They never understood it. Nobody taught them. So the same way they were lifting their hands was the way they were clapping too because they got in among people and when, when people were excited about something, they clapped. And so they also clapped. So if they were to hear the kind of things I'm talking about now when I say that clapping is neither praise nor worship, they'll be offended because all their life long they've been clapping. All their life long they've been clapping. They've clapped more for God. They clap more than they clap. Clap more, they clap. You know? Even in some languages, you know, they're singing, they say, Apple! Then they do it more. Then some will do it, and then they go down, 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 clap, clap, like, you know, a clapping competition. But they don't know. That it is neither praise nor worship. It's not a praise to God. It's not a worship of God. It's neither praise nor worship. So they just do it. So in their minds, if you said, don't clap. If you said, don't clap. It's like you're taking something away from them. Because this is what they're used to. They've clapped all their life long when they got excited about something. They clapped so much they thought that that was a huge offering to God. They said, let's give the Lord a clap offering. 
a clap offering. It's like in the Old Testament when you would say, let's give the Lord a camel offering. And camel, you couldn't give God an offering of a camel. It's one of those animals you couldn't use for an offering. The priest will say, no. You can give it as a gift to your friends. But you cannot offer it to God as a sacrifice. If, what if that's all you have? You, you've got to redeem it. You've got to do something about it. You sell it. You can bring it as a camel and give it to God as an offering. There are other animals that could not be accepted. So you, 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 just because you're used to camels around you doesn't mean you come to God and offer him a camel for sacrifice. So when they say, let's give the Lord a clap offering, those people have never studied the Bible. They don't understand the scriptures. They think anything goes. Because they, all their life long, they've heard other pastors say it. They grew up in the church, the pastor said so. The preacher said so. The song leader said so. So in their excitement, they said, let's give the Lord a clap offering. Did they ever read the Bible to know whether that was right, that was acceptable to God? Is every offering acceptable? The question is whether we want to do what is right or not. That's the question. Do we want to do what is right? Do we want to do what is right? Or we want to do what we feel? We want to do what we like. You know, I know that God raised me for a certain, for a purpose. There's never been anyone in the history of the world that was given as much a platform to speak to such great percentage of the world's population as I have been given in the history of the world. So I understand the importance of these things. And why? The corrections must be given. So, what are you going to do with clapping? Can you see it? You put it in the, in the right place. When they danced, we clapped. Why? A sign of approval. Yeah, we liked what you did. That's wonderful. So you clap, you let them know you liked it. It was great. But we don't do that to God. We don't do that to God. We don't do that for God. We don't show God a sign of approval. He is God. So, no such thing. It's, it's, not, it's not right to say um, we're giving God a clap offering. We don't give him a clap offering. 
No. The New Testament was written for the church. And he gave us the epistles to live by. So you want to know the will of God? You go into the New Testament. To know his will for the church. And you read the New Testament in the light of the epistles. Which means... Your understanding of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John must be in the light of the epistles. Because there are things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that were not written or instructed for the church. And if you don't understand the epistles, you think everything goes question is do you want to live the the life of the christian a real christian or do you want to live a religious life defined by men as the christian life of course there are those who would not bother about the, no they don't they think that uh, Things like these are about splitting hairs. But you see, the quality of your spiritual life is directly connected to the revelation of the word of God that you have. You can't live above it. You can't live above the knowledge of God's word in your heart and your spirit. I'll give you an example in the Old Testament, something that happened to describe certain situations. One day, Samuel the prophet, when Israel was preparing for war, set a date and time with Saul, the king of Israel, that he would arrive. And the sacrifice would need to be offered. Before they would go. On this. War. And then Saul was waiting. For some of the prophet to arrive. And it passed the time that Samuel should have showed up. And Saul thought about something that we, 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 can't, we can't keep waiting. We can't keep waiting. And he went ahead and offered the sacrifice. Then, he did another thing. He was asked to go and destroy the Amalekites. And to destroy everything. Spare nothing, he was told. This is God's instruction. But when he went and destroyed them, he saved the king alive. Only God knows what he planned to do with him. And then preserved the best of the cattle. Another good reason. 
Reason one for offering sacrifice. Remember, it says the, 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 the prophet came late. And the prophet was the priest also. It says it came late. So he had to go ahead and do it. And then this time, why did he, why did he keep these animals? He said the, the people kept them so that we can offer them as sacrifices to God. What was God's response, the prophet's response to Saul in these actions? Saul said to him, thou hast done foolishly. You see, he used human wisdom to make his decisions on what he was going to do. We have to have this sacrifice offered. Where is the prophet? Where is he? Where is the priest? What's going on? He hasn't come. All right. The deadline has passed. So he went ahead and offered it. Somebody said, why can you blame him? Then he kept these things, these animals, the best of them, to be offered to God in sacrifice. He wasn't planning on eating them. He wasn't planning on keeping them for himself. He says, we want to offer them to God. But the word of God came to him and said, you have done foolishly. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. You have done foolishly. Why are you thinking that this is wise? Anybody else would probably agree with you and say, yeah, what else, what else should you have done? But God said, no. You have done foolishly. There's a difference between human wisdom and spiritual wisdom. Human wisdom. It's different from spiritual wisdom. So in the eyes of God, while the man was thinking he had done something wise, and the people agreed with him. The people agreed with him. They agreed with Saul, King Saul. The people agreed with him. But God said, this is foolish. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to hearken, to pay heed to what God's telling you, than the fat of rams. How many of God's children are living in disobedience? Using their human wisdom to interpret ministry and life. And how many are supporting them? And making them believe that what they're doing or saying is right. I tell you something, it doesn't matter who supports you when you do something. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who agrees with you. If God's word is against what, against what you've done, you're in soup. You're in trouble. And all the people put together cannot save you. To obey is better than sacrifice. To hack the fat of us. Join us tomorrow as we give you another teaching excerpt on praise. To get other related messages, kindly visit the Pastor Chris Digital Library, available on the Love Old App Store.